Hi guys, it's Shelly Tugas. I'm back reading chapter five of Finders Keepers, a book I wrote. And um, this one begins when Krista is now um, being cared for by the grumpy next door neighbor, Edmund Clark, and plays with his grandson, Alex. And one thing that they like to do uh, when they're together is they role play little adventures. Um, and that's how this chapter starts. Um, they're discovering treasure in a shipwreck, and Krista becomes Chase Truegood, and Alex becomes a character named Buck Punch, and they often refer to Chase's older sister, Jade Truegood, which you could probably place represents uh, her real-life sister, Amelia. This chapter is <clears throat> The Canoe and the Basement. Discovering treasure in a shipwreck. The adventure. Searching for Buck Punch's family fortune. The place, Whitefish Island, the Pacific Ocean. The wardrobe and props, scuba suits, which are swimsuits with life jackets, oxygen tanks, which are thermoses held in place with the belt, exploration collectron tools, which are coffee mugs, forks, spoons, and salad tongs, and rope, which is rope. Chase, True Good, and Buck Punch have survived many adventures, but searching for Captain Capone's last treasure might be their last. A year before, infamous pirate Captain Capone stole Buck's family fortune and kidnapped Chase's sister Jade. Capone's ship disappeared in the fog and shark-filled waters by Whitefish Island. The ship has never been found until now by treasure hunters Chase Truegood and Buck Punch. Buck, with the survivor rope tied around his wrist, jumped into the thrashing waves from the dock of their explorer ship. Chase tightened her goggles and pressed her face into the water to watch for deadly sharks. When Chase felt a tug, she pulled the rope with all her might until Buck popped from the water. He coughed up seawater and said, it's definitely Captain Capone's ship says so right on the side. Good thing my goggles have lights. Buck emptied rocks from the, collect the exploration collectron mug next to Chase. Chase inspected Buck's samples with the electron collectron spoon. This stone is from the necklace Jade was wearing when she was kidnapped. Do you think she survived the shipwreck? Mm, depends, Buck said. Was she a good swimmer? Chase said a long time ago she was the fastest. Then she got slow and turned afraid and retired. Buck nodded. Sharks are thick down there. Maybe they ate her. He straightened his goggles. I'm going to go back down and look for my family's fortune. I better go too, Buck. It's almost feeding time for the sharks and two people ought to be down there. Buck said, you stayed here. I don't need backup. I'll be the front up. You be the back up. Chase, I'm the fastest swimmer. I'll be the front up. Chase wondered if Buck's concussion from his earlier dive was making him crazy. Everyone knew she'd won the international swimming race three years in a row. Despite his very best try, Buck came in last. Chase said, we'll dive together. We can't take chances. We need that money in case Captain Capone is holding my sister hostage and wants a ransom. Yes, Buck said. I'll give you the money. You're the best partner ever, Buck. Buck and Chase dove into the dark waves and blasted to the ocean floor at top speed. They pulled themselves around the ship, sticking their hands in every hole, feeling around for gold and silver. Buck grabbed Chase's arms. Having been trained in sign language, he signed a message to Chase. Look out, sharks! Hide in the ship! Chase signed back with her uh, with scared fingers. Before Buck could answer, his whole body jerked, chomped. Buck was chomped by a shark. Chase remembered the bottle of shark repellent in her scuba suit. As she sprayed the shark's face, Chase bull pulled Buck to the surface. They had barely climbed onto their explorer boat when the shark torpedoed out of the water, narrowly missing Chase's head. Buck rolled in pain. You got me, Chase. Thank God it's only a scratch. Yeah, a scratch. 
but the sharks at Whitefish Island have poison on their fins. It finned me, Chase. Buck's eyelashes flutter, then closed. Chase said, Buck, hang on. I've got the anti-fin medicine in the starboard engine. He moaned. Too late, Chase. Go on without me. Find the treasure and save your sister. We'll find the fortune together or we won't find it at all. Chase screamed. Chase, true good. Turn down the volume, will ya? Amelia stood on the dock, hands on her hips, showing off her uniform, jean shorts, and an Itza some pizza t-shirt. I'm going to work and you guys are being called for lunch. A storm's coming, so your next bold adventure might be a card game. Clouds were collecting in the sky, gathering in gray clumps, and Amelia the princess stared into the water. Is that a canoe? I shrugged. Really? You guys sunk a canoe? Alex? He said. I think it was an accident. It was not an accident, Amelia said. Why did you do that? I took off my goggles so I could see her better. Well, I said, we needed a shipwreck. It's not easy to sink a canoe, trust me. Alex had to pour water into it while I jumped up and down, and I fell like 20 times. This information would have impressed Amelia, my sister. She took a deep sigh and said, that's correct. It is not easy to sink a canoe. And you know why? She paused, but neither of us answered. Because canoes float. Where is Mr. Clark? Are you supposed to be down here without supervision? I asked, hey, do you want to play when you get home? Krista, I asked you a question. Are you supposed to be down here without supervision? Alex said, Grandpa said it's okay as long as we're wearing life jackets. Do you, Amelia? I asked, it's fun. This canoe is so awesome. Come on, it'll be fun. She shook her head and stomped to mom's car without a word. Alex pulled himself onto the dock and unclipped his life jacket. You think we're going to be in trouble? He wiped his face with the towel, which was so dirty it left brown streaks on his face. I crossed my fingers behind my back and said, It's a boat. Water can't hurt it, Alex. Cheese sandwiches were already on the table with cans of orange soda and potato chips. This was our first lunch with Mr. Edmund Clark, and we were off to a really good start. No tuna, no carrots, no raisins, and no apple slices. He understood potato chips came from vegetables, luckily. The air was heavy and thunder, thunder grumbled. I loved storms because they gave the, the woods a bath and everything smelled pure. I poked Alice. You know why it smells good after it rains? Because your nose sensors need cleaning. He said this all confident like he'd learned it at school. I laughed. <clears throat> That's just stupid. You wouldn't know about rain because you're from Arizona and rain, it smells nice because it kicks, kicks up bacteria from the ground and the bacteria smell good, kind of sweet actually. <clears throat> he picked the crust from his sandwich without breaking it and said, now that's just stupid. My mom's a science teacher and she told me. Hmm, Alex said, well, dough smells good because water kicks the yeast around and it makes the smell of dough. My family's pizza is so good because we got the recipe from Italian people in Chicago. I've been wanting to ask Alex about his family and gangsters since our visit to the bait shop. This was my chance. Were the Italian people gangsters by any chance? Alex chewed fast and hard. I don't know. Who cares? That was like a hundred years ago. If my family knew gangsters, they were probably trying to reform them. Hmm, I said. Maybe that's why your grandpa wants to donate all the gangster money to the National Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame. He wants to do something good with bad money. Potato chips flew from Alex's mouth as he talked. There isn't any gangster money. I asked my dad about everything the sheriff said at the bait shop. My dad said small towns are rumor mills, and that's partly why he left. He said everything started from one stupid pitcher. 
one night, I guess, Al Capone ate dinner at Clark's Fine Dining, and my great-grandpa asked if they could get a picture taken together because, you know, Capone was famous. So they did, and my great-grandpa hung it on the wall, and that was it. He served Capone a steak, and they took a picture. I asked, well, did you ask your grandpa about it, Mr. Edmund Clark? I asked my dad, why would I ask my grandpa? Well, your dad wasn't even born then. Your grandpa, well, he's closer to the real story. Alex said, I just told you the real story. Well, then why do people keep rummaging around the basement of the restaurant? He kept me waiting while he chugged his soda. Because people here are stupid. I couldn't believe those words came from his mouth. I wanted to throw potato chips at him, but I was too afraid of Mr. Edmund Clark. I slipped my hands between my legs in the chair so I wouldn't use them for trouble. I said, you get to live here and you don't even know how lucky you are. Alex said, why do you like it here so much? Because it's awesome. What's so awesome about it? I don't see anything awesome. I said, well, if it wasn't thundering, we could play in the rain, and playing in the rain is awesome. Alex brought his plate to the sink and sort of slammed it against the counter. He stood in front of the window, his back to me, watching the rain hammer the earth. Even if I tried to explain, he wouldn't get it because he loved Arizona and probably had like a hundred friends there and probably never got in trouble at school. I loved the Northwoods for so many reasons. At the cabin, my parents belonged to me instead of their students. There weren't any girls at Whitefish Lake telling me my clothes didn't match or that my hair looked funny. In school, I had to sit on my hands to keep them from causing trouble. My hands could do anything at the cabin because they didn't have to be wrapped around a pencil. And for a long time, I had the world's best cabin friend, my sister Amelia. Alex shoved his fists in his pockets. I don't like rain, and my dad says it rains half the summer, and dad likes it dry, and he doesn't like ice, and he doesn't like snow or rain or lakes or pine trees. Ugh, why'd he come back if he hates it so much? Alex said, well, grandpa's old and sick, and my grandma has been dead since my dad was a kid, and so I guess, I guess grandpa's pretty lonely. Mom wants him to make peace. And dad thought it'd be good to own a restaurant instead of work for someone who owns a restaurant. I said, trust me, he picked a good place to own a restaurant, even if it rains, even if it gets cold. The cold is amazing, actually. If you cry outside in the winter, your eyes actually freeze shut. Where else does something like that happen? Alex said, you have to be a crybaby to freeze your eyes shut. Alex picked a stray potato chip off the floor and ate it like it was no big deal that it had been on a dirty floor. Just chewed and swallowed without even shouting, five-second rule. I liked Alex, even if he was confused about Wisconsin. I wanted this argument, almost argument, to end, so I didn't let myself get mad about the crybaby thing. I said, well, sometimes I get the eye sweats when I'm sad, but that's not crying. Alex said, I didn't get the eye sweats when I left all my friends in Arizona, but they did all of them. It was like a, an, an army of friends with sweaty eyes. Alex was lucky to have an army of friends to miss. I didn't have an army. The girls in my class didn't invite me to their parties or sleepovers because... I don't like dolls. I don't like jewelry making kids, crafts, hair braiding, cookie baking, dancing, gymnastics, reading, cute clothes, or sparkle shoes. Those girls said my pretend play is weird. At home, I only had my neighbor, Denny Kellerman. He liked making up stories, but he was only eight. And he spent summer in daycare. And he whined a lot. Alex, he was way better than Denny Kellerman. So what should we do when the storm stops? I asked. You better think of something because you can't pester me all day. The voice 
came from Mr. Edmund Clark, and I almost jumped out of my chair. He'd wandered into the kitchen for some water. I thought the kitchen must be as old as Mr. Edmund Clark. Someone had painted the cupboards white, but the paint bubbled and peeled. You could see the dirt around the handles, too. The beige countertop was stained and the floor was sticky. He should have been spending the gangster money on a new kitchen, or at least a cleaning lady. Alex said, when it stops raining, would you take us out on the boat, maybe tubing? Tubing? You can barely swim thanks to living in a state drier than the moon. Aristona. Good lord, it should be a prison colony. I can float, Alex said. Besides, I'll wear a life jacket. Mr. Edmund Clark sounded, said something that sounded like no, just as thunder shook the house. Then he wiped his mouth with his sleeve and shook his head. Darn thunderstorm. Oh, what am I going to do with you two? Alex said, you want to watch a movie, Krista? Mr. Edmund Clark grumped. Mm, don't be getting any ideas about changing up my television programs. You can run around the basement, but don't touch my taxidermy tools. I had no idea Mr. Edmund Clark was an artist. Taxidermy. That made him a little bit scary. Less scary. I so wanted to touch his taxidermy stuff. Alex said to me, uh, one of his squirrels is posed like a ballet dancer spinning on one foot. It's like something from a scary movie. It's funny. Mr. Edmund Clark slapped his hand on the table. Don't you know funny when you see it? I'm building a collection for you and your father so you have something to remember me by after I croak. Alex said, do we really have to play in the basement? Something wrong with the basement? It's an indoor playground. It's dark, Alex said. And that, that one stuffed raccoon doesn't have any eyes. It's, it's old and it's scary. Basements don't scare me, I said. Me either, Alex said. I, I was just thinking of you. Mr. Edmund Clark's voice boomed with the thunder. I'm old and scary. There ain't nothing wrong with old and scary. He got quiet and he leaned closer to us and said, Boo! We screamed. He laughed and laughed. So that is chapter five. I will be back tomorrow, Saturday, with uh, chapter six. I hope you guys have a great night. And um, we're really excited to have you come back to the library soon. We miss you. Bye.